thanks Mike, one of our deacons, who we have known each other for a long time. And uh, it's been awesome to journey with you in Lyle Land. Well, good morning, church. Good to be with you guys. Turn to Genesis chapter 11. Yes, it is our final week in Genesis. It's only taken us 10 months to get through the first 11 chapters, but you guys have done well. We've covered a lot of topics. And uh, if I was to connect what Mike was sharing from James four to our message this morning is what James writes just prior to the passage Mike read, that God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And uh, what a way to conclude our series through Genesis, to remind ourselves that there is no room for pride and only room for humility before a great and gracious God who has designed us to, to worship him and to live according to his, his ways. And yet, there are many of us that want to challenge his authority, and there's many that want to be above the law, like one of our uh, Arizona-owned uh, public civil servants, Paul Mosley. If you don't know the name Paul Mosley, uh, he is a Republican representative from Lake Havasu who uh, got pulled over several months ago for doing almost 100 miles per hour in a 65 speed limit zone. And uh, as the cop pulled him over, the, the, the camera, the body cam was going, and he was almost boasting in the fact that not only was he speeding that very moment that he was pulled over, but he frequently does it. And he claimed the fact that he has legislative immunity to go as fast as he wants because as long as the legislature's in session, you cannot be cited for such things. He boasted in frequently breaking the law, and it came to a point where he had to appear in court in September. Oh, no, it was August, and he, he basically didn't show up for his court hearing, thinking that, again, he doesn't need to go. He's above the law until there was a warrant for his arrest. And upon hearing about the warrant for his arrest, guess who showed up to court? And he could face up to 30 days in jail. So one of our own elected officials thought, you know, I'm above the law. But lest we be quick to point fingers at Representative Mosley, and I don't know Mosley, uh, I can appreciate the way he drives. <laughs> I'm being honest. But all of us, if we look in our hearts, can relate with a desire to be above the law. A, a, a desire to act or behave in some sort of way where, where we pledge some sort of humanitarian immunity where, no God, I know you want me to do this, but I'm going to choose to do otherwise. Is there anyone in this room this morning that has known what God has clearly called for them to do and has acted contrary to what God wants. Just curious. Okay, those that didn't raise your hand, you're guilty just for the fact you didn't raise your hand. The fact that we are, we are rebels. We are, we are rebellious. We are disobedient. <laughs> we, we are obstinate creatures who have, who have clearly written on our hearts have this, this design. And we know when we don't do what God wants us to do, there's this thing called conscience. And there's this thing called conviction. And God has planted that within every single human heart. And we have to realize that until we come in concert with what God wants for us, we will be rebels and there will be continual dissatisfaction in our lives. Someone once said these words, man proposes, but God disposes. Someone else said, man does what he can, but God does what he will. Meaning, even our best laid plans, if they're not according to God's ways, will be crushed. Check out the Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs are always good for, for great little sayings. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. What is this saying? Oftentimes, our will is far different from God's will. Amen? How about Proverbs chapter 14? Look what the, the, the proverb says. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Proverbs, and not only Proverbs, but the scriptures 
are filled with this truth. That unless we come under the authority of God and live in submission to what he wants, his will, we will constantly be frustrated. And we, we find all these creative ways to deal with the frustration. But deep down inside, there's no way of escaping the fact that God wants us to do what he wants us to do. And that we have to allow him to deal with the rebellion that exists within each and every one of our hearts. Genesis chapter 11 is where we're going to be this morning. We're not going to look at the total chapter. We're going to look at the first nine verses. Because in reality, we've come full circle in Genesis. God creates the heavens and the earth and the world in Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Detailed accounts of creation. Genesis 3, there's humanity that has been created. But humanity chooses to do what God doesn't want them to do, right? Adam and Eve, disobedient, disobedient, eating from the tree that they were forbidden not to eat from, right? God, thanks, but no thanks, we'll do what we want. And what happened to them? They were expelled from the garden. God showed them grace in covering them and forgiving them, but he expelled them from the garden. Well, we've come full circle because in Genesis 11, you're going to meet a group of people who basically go to God and say, God, thanks, but no thanks, we'll do what we want. And what happens to this group of people? They are expelled. (laughs) They're expelled from being a community to be now scattered throughout the world with different languages. And here's an interesting note, because Genesis 11 actually comes before Genesis chapter 10. The Bible is not chronological, as some of us would, would like to understand. Last week, we talked about the table of nations. And all these people groups and all these nations and tribes and languages, well, you you need to know how that all came about. It came about because of chapter 11, their disobedience. And so what the writer wants us to understand is that he says there's a literary device now in place that's going to tell you why Genesis 10 talks about this table of nations is because Genesis 11 says they were disobedient and they were scattered. So turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 11. We're going to look at... This account, very familiar account, called the, you know, dealing with the Tower of Babel. And, and whether it be Adam, whether it be Noah, all people are ordered by God to exercise dominion on earth for God's glory. And when we don't choose that, there are consequences. The whole term Babel or Babylon is used not only literally, but also figuratively throughout Scripture to to represent this symbolic rebellion against authority, this rebellion against God. And so as we read this and as we talk about this this morning, we are meant to reflect on human community, human achievements, human pride from the vantage point of God for the purposes to say even the things we think are good, if they're they're conducted in such a way that's antithesis to what God wants. There's, there's judgment because God will not, he will not tolerate rivals for his glory. He will not tolerate rivals for his throne. And so look at Genesis 9, I mean 11 verse 1. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. They are unified. Genesis 10 said that all these tribes went out and they had different languages. So again, This is prior to Genesis 10. And it came about that as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. And let's build ourselves a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they begin to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down. And there confuse their language 
that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from over there from the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, it sounds like, just uh, uh, upon first reading of this, that, that God's got some, like, insecurity issues. Right? Like, oh, no, look what humanity's doing. Uh, I can't let them be more successful than me. I'm going to come in and squash their plan. But there's so much more going on here. And, and, and this morning, we're going to look at two movements in this text. The first four verses... And then verses 5 through 9. The first is the rebellion of Babel. The second is the reversal of Babel. What are we to understand from this text? What does God want us to know? See, unfortunately, this topic of pride can be traced throughout the Bible and history. Pride is that first sin introduced to the human race, Genesis 3, and it will be the last sin uprooted from the human race according to the book of Revelation. So from Genesis to Revelation, we've got this pride issue. C.S. Lewis called pride the mother hen of all sins. And yet we see it not only in Scripture, but whether we go from Babel to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel to, to Herod when Christ was here to Hitler and current prideful men and women, it never pays to rebel against God's will. Is that a good, that's a good proverb. That's a Scott Morgan proverb right there. It never pays to rebel against God's will. Consider the words of, once again, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. What does it say? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And even Jesus himself said in Matthew 23, verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. These are contrary truths to our contemporary cultural thinking right the the culture we live in says pull yourself up by your bootstraps right make a name for yourself seek a reputation be successful and yet the very things that god communicates to us are so countercultural. and so we look at this incident this scene here and in reality we're going to see how far society can go without having god involved in their lives or in the mix What these people are trying to do, and I'm going to explain this in the first four verses, is that they are trying to set up a culture without God. How far can we go as a society with God not being involved in our lives? Not very far. Look at pride on display. And and just so you know, one character is leading the parade, and his name is Nimrod. We met Nimrod last week, remember? We all kind of poked fun in his name, and... We should, because Nimrod's name literally means we shall rebel. So who better to appoint to be the ringleader of humanity's rebellion before God? Nimrod. So the the lesson today is don't be a Nimrod, all right? Check out what's going on here. They're going to build three things. And I'm going to show you how these building these three things are, are totally opposed to God's work and will and way. They're going to build a city, they're going to build a religion, and they're going to build a name. The first is this, they're going to build a city, and this has to do with the importance of ingenuity. You get a bunch of people together, and they're going to come up with some really amazing ideas. You get a group of smart people together, they're going to come up with some creative ways to, to deal with life. And so we see this in that instead of multiplying and scattering remember god's will was to say go fill the earth go and multiply and fill the earth this is exactly what they don't do they all stay together and they move east to the land of shinar so we are to understand that noah and his wife and their sons they all go and they settle in this land called Shinar. They should have scattered and filled the earth, but they didn't. They stayed together. They were this cluster of people. And they went, what direction? East. Symbolically in Genesis, whenever you head east, you head away from God. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, guess what direction they went? 
east. When Lot left Abraham's presence, guess what direction he went? East. The writer wants you to understand movement east is movement away from God. So these people travel east as a symbol of universal rebellion. We will not disperse and be scattered and fill the earth. We will stay together. And what should have been a declaration of worship is now a declaration of war. And here they go, putting their minds and their resources together. And I'm going to tell you something. When it comes to pride, ingenuity strengthens proud ambition. The more we become creative, the more we make advances technologically, we progress as a society. Tomorrow, guys, they are going to announce the civilian who gets to go to the moon. Tomorrow. There is a private citizen whose name will be announced who gets to be the first civilian that gets to go to the moon. And we sit there and go, that's awesome. Like, I would love to be that person. But I sit there and go, but, but why? Why would I want to be that person? Because you know that person's legacy, their reputation, their name is going to go on for, for, for ages. They were the first non-astronaut to go to the moon. And, and to think that we sent a man to the moon when it was the first time. It was about 50 years ago. Now we get to fi finally send a civilian out there, and who knows how things will progress after that. Maybe within 10 years, there's shuttles of people going to the moon, right? And, and why is there this craving to know what's out there, and can non-astronaut-type people like us go to the moon, and what is beyond the moon, and can we maybe inhabit Mars one day, right? Like Elon Musk t-shirt says, Occupy Mars. Like, there's this desire to know. But the more we make these advances, and the more we search not only the micro-universe, but the macro-universe, it's only going to fuel, I believe, a continual dissatisfaction that exists within us. Because even our best ingenuity doesn't satisfy without God. Amen? I celebrate these advances, but the more technologically advanced we become, the more it fuels man-centered pride and gets our eyes off God. So we ought to be more careful. These people come together, and they're going to build <laughs> something amazing, right? In their own eyes, they're building something awesome. And can I tell you, we can point at traveling to the moon, and we can point to, to Elon Musk, and we can point to technology, but I, I'm part of a culture called the church and, and a group of pastors, and we tend to celebrate our own ingenuity in evangelical circles, I think, to our shame. Can I tell you, we have amazing buildings in churches. I, I passed by a church a couple months ago in Chandler, and on their marquee on the street said, come see our new worship center. This is on a major road, as if some, like, non-believer is driving along going, ooh, that sounds exciting. Let's go see the new worship center. There's nothing wrong with building new worship centers, but I, I'm going to tell you, like, I am part of a culture where we get excited about really trivial things. Like, did you see the way that church sanctuary was designed? It really is conducive to worship in that environment. Like, did you, do you know that there is just the right amount of soundproofing where you can't hear the espresso grinders, but there's enough where the smell of espresso comes in? <laughs> the, the design is spectacular. And the lights, when that, when that light came down on that singer and the fog was just perfect, like, you know there's fog in churches because they need to know when the Holy Spirit's showing up. So they bring out the fog machine, and, and there, it, there it is, right? Yep. Uh, we, we're, ours is on order, right? Our fog machine's coming. Okay, so, um, we, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but we tend to worship things that, yeah, we can buy and we can produce and we can design. And I, and I love one mentor of mine said this, we have the most amazing churches that man can build, but we're desperate for the churches where the Holy Spirit's going to show up and do a work. W wow. Like, Shame on us for glorifying and celebrating things that will not matter in time and eternity. Because even the best churches here will be crushed by God. You can think about this. Like, that's not a good building campaign motto. 
Let's raise $30 million and build these worship centers because ultimately it's going to burn up one day. Did you know that? God will destroy even the best churches. You know who's saved out of that lot? Those who love Christ and love him desperately. Amen? So let's be gone with come see our worship center. Let's be gone with all this celebration of of what we can do. You are not called to build a city. You're not called to put your ingenuity on display if it means self-glorification. More about that here in a moment. They're going to build a religion. Not only is this, is this city amazing in their eyes, but they're going to build this thing called a ziggurat. We have a picture of the ziggurat back there on the, um, on the computer. You guys need to check this out. So this is pretty awesome. Look at this thing. So archaeologists have found these all over the, the Middle East. And, and this was probably what these people built. And this was going to be the center of their city. And we are talking stories. This thing is like, see the person like way down there in the corner? Like this is a huge structure. And they did this because of the fact that God has set eternity in the hearts of men and women. And we are designed to worship. The problem is they're going to build their own religion because they've ixnayed the religion that God wants for them, the faith that God wants for them. And notice at the top, notice the color of the, of the top portion. It's blue. Because when they designed these, it was supposed to blend in with the heavens and the sky and the clouds so that you couldn't see where the heavens uh, ended and where their building uh, ended. It all kind of met there. And and archaeologists have found this blue enamel on these structures that are 5,000 years old. And not only is there this blue enamel, this blue paint, but there's also these zodiac images all over the top of it. As if... This is our way to connect with, with the other out there. You know, this is our, our way to connect with deity. And so they build these things. This is the center of their culture. And essentially what this is communicating is that they are building a tower and they're designing their own worship. They're designing their own religion. And did you know Babel, in their understanding, means the gate of God. As if we're going to build something and let's allow God to come through what we build. Can we just stop right there? God doesn't need you to build something for him to come. Right? He does not dwell in structures made with human hands. And yet, the, the ziggurat and what they're doing is a picture of every human religious enterprise. The, po- the Tower of Babel is literally a Home Depot religion. <laughs> Do it yourself right? You come in and, you know, you, you have this approach to spirituality and it's mixed with this passion for power and this distaste for obedience and this prideful drive for popularity and this compromise on ethical standards. And you know what? We don't want to offend and we don't want to say one truth is more important than the other truth and just worship. As long as it's sincere. Can I tell you this week, I had a con- I, I'm having a conversation on Facebook, which is wrong right then and there. But I've got atheist guys that I'm ha- I opened Pandora's box because 9-11, right, happened and we are remembering 17 years ago what happened. And, of course, these atheists are pointing at, see what religion does. And I sit there and I'm going, okay, should I even say something? And I do. And now I regret it. <laughs> but the reality of it is this, is that we are surrounded by these man-made religions where we kind of, do what we want to do. And the problem is that people are sincerely believing something that's false. How do you even navigate that? And all I can do is point them to Christ. And boy, you mentioned Jesus and you say Jesus is the only way. These guys, it's like adding gasoline onto a campfire. I mean, it's just like, (laughs) so pray for me in that. Um, But but workspace religion, workspace righteousness has been with us from the very beginning. What I mean by that is this. We think that somehow, some way, we can contribute to our salvation. Can I just tell you right now, in the, in the simplest way possible, you can do nothing to be saved apart from the grace of God given in Jesus Christ. And simply because of that fact, it should be the most freeing thing we ever hear. 
right? Because we try to come in and be like, but can I bring this to the, no! God says, I'm having a party, don't bring anything. My wife hates that. Like, she's like, we gotta bring something. I'm like, they said nothing, right? They, I'm, gonna, I'm going literal on this, we're not gonna bring anything, but we've gotta contribute. Like, we feel so much better about ourselves when we contribute, and God says, you don't want a religion based upon that. Come empty-handed, naked and poor, and come taste the water that is given to you without charge. And yet the people of Babel didn't understand this. They didn't want to. They didn't want to. Why? Because there's something about building a religion that at the end of the day you can have confidence because of what you've contributed leads nothing to a despair and empty faith which is why number three is important. They're building a name. And this is the importance of reputation. So there's the importance of uh, ingenuity. There's the importance of worship. There's the importance of a reputation. Can I really just, I want to unpack this with you guys, just earnestly and honestly with you this morning, that there are two things that motivate us to build a name, ambition and, and fear. There's two things that fuel this desire to make a name, to realize that we all wrestle with contributing something, that we want our lives to mean something. We want to be significant. We want to do something significant. We want to leave behind a legacy. And there's two things that motivate this. It is ambition and it is fear. And can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that it is part of our nature as human beings to build monuments to human accomplishment. I mean, you go around the world and you go to Paris, France, what do you want to see? The Eiffel Tower, right? You go to Egypt, what do you want to see? The pyramids. You go to China, what do you want to walk on? The Great Wall, right? All these monuments to human achievement. And yet, we use these things to somehow make ourselves seem more important and more significant than we ought. This is probably why when you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, there's none of that. (laughs) <laughs> right you look at the grand canyon you're like there's no one that said you know erected 1914 by joe schmo right he didn't build the grand canyon and yet you're standing in front of this thing that's like this is so beyond anything we're able to do and so what we need to understand is like what frederick nietzsche said if you don't know nietzsche he was an antagonist to christianity he said the most fundamental drive in the human heart is the will to power and this lust for dominance And so, it's the pursuit of security and the pursuit of the fact that I don't want to be anonymous that fuels this desire to build a name. Notice those three things are right there in Genesis chapter 11. They want to build a city. They want to build a a religion. They want to build a name. I'm going to tell you guys right now that only what's done for one name, Christ's name, will last. It is a fruitless, futile pursuit to try to build a name for yourself. This is, this is never made more, more impactful in my life than to think about men and women who have mentored me. And 20, 30 years ago, man, they, their name was all over the place. Now you mention their name to people, especially some of the younger generations. They're like, who is that? Like to even realize myself that one day Scott Morgan will be here and one day Scott Morgan will be gone and people 10 years, 20 years from now may go, Scott who? And boy, you know what? Can I tell you, the older I get, the more freeing that becomes. Less about making a name or building a reputation because this is the thing that drives politicians, it drives pastors, it drives athletes, right? It drives each and every one of us. That, you know, we want to seek esteem. We want to have others think we're successful because it fuels something in us. Security. And that security is so misplaced. We are encouraged to not seek a reputation. We are encouraged not to seek a name. I love how one author says it. He says it like this. The hatred of anonymity drives men to heroic feats of valor or long hours of drudgery. Or it urges them to spectacular acts of shame or of unscrupulous self-preferment. 
in its worst forms, it tempts men to give the honor and glory to themselves, which properly belongs to the name of God. Can I tell you how this manifests itself most recently in my life? There's a, uh, there's a big conference coming to town in two months that, uh, that I was asked to be a part of. Ooh, a name, a reputation. Ooh, I'll bite. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is the kind of conference when they send out a mailer to people's houses, it gives, like, pictures of pastors on it. And it says, so-and-so pastor, pastor of 15,000-member church in California. And the next one is, so-and-so pastor, pastor of 25,000-member church in, in Virginia. And, and, you know, it's got, like, this people, like, pastors start salivating because they're like, oh, it's coming to town, and you're sending me an invitation. Like, I, but then there's me, Pastor Scott Morgan, pastor of who pastors at a coffee house in Chandler, where if you blink, you'll pass it. You don't even see it. People drive like, I didn't even know you guys were here. Like, that is the best word for me. I, p I never knew you were here. Like, God has, years ago, that used to torment me. How come you didn't know we were here? How come you don't know my name? How come you don't know about the church that meets here? And, and now the more I hear about people not knowing about us, the more I get excited about that. You want to know why? Because the Lord is, is, is working on my heart to say, you don't need to make a name for yourself. You don't need to seek a reputation. Like, I want the flip side of that card to be like Pastor Scott Morgan and maybe show like the worst picture of me and say, yeah, you know what? He actually got kicked out of a church one time and the church that he has now is this ragtag bunch of people that meet in a coffee house. But if you want to come to this conference, come. You, know, you, might, you might hear something good. Like, for me, I sit there and go, that's fun. That's exciting. Like, the fact that I'm even on this roster of, like, you feel like the kid at Thanksgiving that used to sit at the kid's table, and now mom and dad said, come sit at the big, ta big kid's table. But, but I like that. And I'm so appreciative of the invitation to be there. And you know what? I hope no one says, so how big is your church? Because I'll slowly just shift gear and go, what's your espresso drink? Like, I will dis deter the conversation. Because what will tell you more, me more about you is not the size of your church, but about what coffee drink you like. Or let's, let's talk about less of size of church in the buildings you've, and I'm glad you made that, that edifice to, to man's glory out there in, in, in Manhattan. But how's your wife? How's your marriage? How are your kids? What are you reading right now that's really, like, challenging you? Like, let's get beyond the, the stupid Right? Let's get beyond the stupid and get to the heart. It is stupid to measure success in ways that the world measures their success. This is not Lehman Brothers. This is not Tesla. Where, oh no, look what Pastor Scott said. Our stock's going down the tubes, right? <laughs> Guys, this is not about making a name. I could care less. And I know that's probably not a good phrase to use, but I'm going to use it anyway. I'll come and go. And there's only one name that matters, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus, my job, you, 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 God's used me. But if this is about me and some achievement, like I'm working on my doctorate, and people are like, are you so excited? I'm kind of like, well, I've already paid thousands of dollars, spent hours doing all my classwork. I might as well do my final project. <gasps> but are you super excited to get it out there and get it published? I, maybe. Like, I mean, don't see that as indifference. It just, just see it as like, if it's used for the kingdom of God and exalting Christ, amen. But if you think this is about me making a name, I'll make you guys call me Dr. Morgan, just so you guys know. <laughs> the doctor is in, right? Like, <laughs> psychiatrist, five cents, I'm all about that. But you know what? Here's what the Bible puts a premium on. You as a disciple of Christ, not glorying in your greatness, but celebrating your littleness. Paul says, it's when I am weak that God is great. It's Paul who says, my good works are nothing but garbage compared to Christ's glory. <laughs> it's Paul 
who, who says these words and says, you know, it's God's bigness that I'm concerned with, not the size of your church. I don't care about how big Missio Dei is. How big is God? This is not an easy journey for a pastor. I have a pastor friend that I just met today from Wichita. Joel, props, where you at, buddy? We, we in our five-minute conversation, could totally identify with each other. Because, you know, we've had train wreck experiences in ministry. And you think any ministry is perfect, you're mistaken. This, this is just real life, and we're just trying to do the best job we can to point people to Christ. But sometimes our pride and our ego gets in the way. I mean, Joel's lost hair over it. Look at him. He's lost his hair over it. All of it. You know what you need more? You know what you need more than another building, church building, pastors? You know what you need more than just your, your current YouTube hot pastor that you can stream their message? You know what you need more than that one church that makes all that great music and I'm just <gasps> sucking it because it's just so good? You know what you need? You don't need more of anything. Ladies and gentlemen in Christ, you only need to be satisfied in God, fully justified in Christ, and fully filled by the Spirit, and that's all you need. Quit thinking God's holding out on you. Though he slays you, yeah, he's going to kick your butt. You want to know why? Because you're like this insatiable little child who keeps asking for more, and God says, I've given you everything. Stop making this about you and become fully satisfied in Christ. Every name will become a joke except for the name of Christ. Read Philippians 2. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. No other name matters. Like God told Abraham, I will make your name great. Because it's only because his faith is placed in God and it comes to full circle and full fruition, Revelation 22. Check out this verse. Verse 4. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Last chapter of the Bible, guys. Is the name of Christ written on your life? Because that it will be the only name that will be uttered echoed celebrated sung for eternity do not find your joy in being praised find your joy in praising him do not find your security in what you are building in your ingenuity but find your security in a god that you say you will gladly obey This is insidious stuff. And thank God there's a second part of this narrative. The reversal of Babel. God doesn't leave us to our own devices, but steps in and does a work where he reverses our, our will and our ways. And, and here it is, the reversal of, of Babel. Because you know what happens when you ascend that ziggurat that I showed you the picture of? You know what you, you, you find when you get up there? You find loneliness. You find despair. You find emptiness. And this is not what God wants for you. Amen? What God wants is he wants to destroy your kingdom so that his kingdom is established. And he will do this. So there's God's immediate response, which is destruction. And then there's his eminent response, which is reconstruction. God has to do a work of complete obliteration before he begins any project that's going to glorify him and exalt Christ. Amen? So there's the first delusion. That's the one of self-importance. Look at verse 5, Genesis 11. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Now, you've got to understand something. This is satire. This is God being condescending. Has anyone ever said to you, don't be condescending towards me? Meaning, what are they doing? They're talking down to you? Well, literally, verse 5 says, God is in the heavens, and he's looking down, and he's like, what's going on down there? What, what, what are you guys building? Like, he comes down from heaven to see, as if 
God doesn't see? Here's the irony, right? It's like God here, down his staircase, gets down on his hands and knees. What you guys got going on down there? What? This is the image, right? Like, God sees our works as really nothing. Because, like, they couldn't build it high enough, so God had to come down and be like, what? What are you guys doing down there? What are, why are you jumping around like that? What's, a pic- what's that picture of the stars over there and that, that false? And so God comes down and is like, don't think you're so self-important. Because, because you're not. He comes down and says, is that the best you can do? <laughs> he says, really, all your creativity led you to this? And, and there's one guy who said it like this. He says, God always has to come down to examine our anthill achievements built on the sidewalk cracks of his creation. Like we celebrate so much, and yet we realize it's all going to crumble. God is not impressed. He is not impressed with the man or the woman that can run with horses, but he's impressed with the man or woman who has a heart for God. So he reverses and says, I'm not impressed with your human works. Secondly, there's the delusion of self-sufficiency, because here's the issue, verse 6. Behold, they're one people, they're unified, and now if we leave this untouched and we don't deal with this, they're going to become incorrigible. And so there's this idea of self-sufficiency, and there's one thing that God doesn't want. He doesn't want us to be self-sufficient. See, God is not worried that humanity is going to rise up and overpower him and dethrone him. He's not, like, acting like, oh, 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 look what they're doing. Like, he barely is like, what's going on down there? But what he's concerned about is this delusion that people don't need him. He's going to come shatter this delusion that, you know what, we're fine without you, God. How, how has that worked out for us as a culture and society? You know, you just, you just don't talk about Jesus. We're going to be okay, really? You don't talk about morals or ethics or anything rooted in the heart of God for humanity. How's that working out for you? God does not want us to be self-sufficient. And then there's the delusion of self-exaltation. You know, that we've built these things, and look what our ingenuity has produced, and we don't need God. And so what's his plan? His plan is to destroy them, uh, what they've built, and scatter them. (laughs) And it's like this. They wake up the next morning to a foreign movie without subtitles. (laughs) You ever done that? Like, one thing my wife, we love movies, but my wife goes, really, is this a subtitled movie? Like, that's the worst movie. And especially if there's no subtitles, would that just be totally horrible? And yet this is what happens. Everyone's speaking a foreign language, and they're trying to like, this is nightmarish. Here they are, and they experience the very thing they feared. Notice the fear. They did not want to be dispersed. And yet the very thing they feared is exactly what was going to happen. And they could have done it God's way and dispersed and been fine, but instead they did it their way and they found that only their dispersion, the thing they feared, but to now be able to not communicate with each other. Do you know the power of language for us as humanity is that very thing that not only communicates words, but it, it communicates culture. It communicates beliefs. It communicates the things that, that we embrace as valuable. It, 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 it sheds light on who we are as a tribe, as a nation, as a people. You know, you can travel all around the world. I'm thinking about, my, you know, there's, there's one writer who said, you travel anywhere in the world, and there's a universal language. There's, there's a thing called Coca-Cola. You can go anywhere in the world. And even if the, the word Coca-Cola doesn't appear, you know the design. You know the colors, right? And no matter where you go in the world, there's Coca-Cola. But if you go anywhere in the world, you can't talk about God and have that same common ground. You can't talk about faith. You can't talk about the Bible. You can't talk about Jesus. Why? Because, yeah, we celebrate Coca-Cola and we've got that in common, but the very thing we need, the very thing that is our hope, Jesus is the very thing that language prevents a bar- provides a barrier for. But glory be to God that he can even work beyond those barriers. Amen? Glory be to God that nothing built for the glory of man will survive, but what done is done for God's glory will endure forever. So God steps in and messes up what we're building to accomplish his will. 
Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Right? Like what Jacob and Lori and Miguel were leading us with this morning in song. We're sitting there going, you are crushing me, God. And I'm going to tell you right now, we ought to thank God for the times he messes up our lives. When was the last time you did that? You said, I'm going to glorify God because he messed my life up. Someone once said it this way. I not only thank God for the prayers he has answered, I thank God for the prayers he, has, he hasn't answered. Right? Because we don't know. We don't know what's best for us. But there's one who does. We don't know what we want ultimately because our hearts are, are fickle and we want all sorts of things. And, and God just says, stop and just know me. Know the power of Christ and him crucified in his sufferings. Philippians chapter 3. Read that chapter this week. But let me close with this. This work of reconstruction. And in the whole rest of chapter 11, which we didn't deal with this morning, can be summarized this way. It's the promise of God that he will bring a deliverer through the line of Abraham. Because you know who's introduced to us at the end of chapter 11 in the chapter 12? Abraham. Father Abraham. And then he signs, right? Like Abraham, the, the central figure of the three major religions in the world. Judaism. Christianity, Islam. Abraham is the one that God said, it is through you that I will bless the world, Abraham. And thus, this is the reversal of Babylon, that God is bringing forth a work where he's not a God of confusion or disorder, but he's a God of order. And this is going to be coming through the lineage of Abraham and ultimately fulfilled in the personal work of Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. And with Christ, you have the fulfillment of all that God has promised. Did you know this? And there's two things we need to consider this morning as we close this section. There's the promise that God at Babel, he says he judges and restrains rebellion. But at Pentecost, God forgives and restores relationship. Because what happens at Pentecost, ladies and gentlemen, Acts chapter 2, all these people groups come with all their different languages, and now the disciples speak in the tongues of their languages so that they can hear one unifying message, and that is Christ. What you have in Acts chapter 2 is a reversal of God's judgment in Genesis chapter 11. And here is what is remarkable, is that God is a God who has told humanity about his promise to do this. Look at Zechariah chapter, Zephaniah Ze uh, chapter 3. Check this out. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Zephaniah. When was the last time you read Zephaniah in the Old Testament? You guys didn't even know there's a book called Zephaniah in the Bible, did you? And yet, what, it, what does this speak to? hundreds of years before Pentecost, that God will bring forth a, a, a message through all the different languages that will be a unifying factor for our healing and our wholeness in the name of Christ. Acts chapter 2, if you missed the scene, here it is. Acts chapter 2, verse 6. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. The disciples who were these untrained fishermen and, and business owners, right? They had studied all these, these languages. All of a sudden now were prompted by the Holy Spirit to speak in a tongue that was now recognized from somebody who had traveled days upon days to be in Jerusalem to hear the message of Christ in their native tongue. Babel is being reversed and it is being reversed in Christ. Which is why the, the, the writer of, of Revelation chapter 5 and chapter 7 celebrates this, that they sang a new song, right? Worthy are you who were slain in your blood ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That Revelation concludes by saying what God had done in the scattering, now Christ is that much more exalted in the gathering. And that gathering can only happen in Jesus Christ. Do we praise God that there's a reversal of Babel happening? Yes. Does it make our work all the more important to go out and tell people about Christ? Yes. 
and does it mean that there is any barrier that exists between me and the person that speaks Serbian or the person that speaks Mandarin or the person that speaks uh, French, that, that God's not working in their hearts? God is working all over this globe, ladies and gentlemen. And one day, all these people with all these different languages will come and there will be one unifying message and that is Jesus Christ. And my invitation to you this morning is for you to taste and see that Christ is good. Because it breaks my heart to read this week that the best Mex- Mexican restaurant in the country is Taco Bell. You guys know this, don't you? There's a poll that came out and people voted Taco Bell the m- b- best Mexican restaurant. I said, we are gone as a human race. We are dead in the water. Are you kidding me? This is like Jeremiah 2. You keep building for yourself cisterns that are going to hold water that ultimately don't think that's going to satisfy you when the only place you need to go to for water is the living streams of Christ. So let me ask you something, ladies and gentlemen, as I close. Are you seeking a city? Are you seeking a city to build? Stop. And seek the one city that will last forever. That's the city of Christ. Are you seeking a a, a tower? Are you seeking a religion? Stop with your works-based righteousness and come to him who says you can bring nothing. Therefore, let me be exalted because poor you came, naked you came, and you had nothing to contribute. I contributed all. Therefore, I alone will get the glory. That's what Christ says. Stop building your towers and come to him who is the strong tower. Are you seeking a reputation or a name? Stop. Stop. Adopt the mentality of John the Baptist, whose goal in life was that Christ would increase so that he would decrease. Christ is ultimate. Amen? Pursue the name that is above every name. Exalt the name that, uh, that one day every tongue will confess and every knee will bow before, the name of Christ. Find your satisfaction in him. Amen. Next week we'll start a new series. We're going to go through the book of Genesis, verse 11. No, we're not. Just kidding. <laughs> See if you guys are awake. Spiritual disciplines. What are some practical things we need to embrace as followers of Christ that are going to help us find our satisfaction in Christ? To, to, to move the needle on what God wants to do in our hearts as far as spiritual maturity. So we're going to do that for 10 weeks. I'm really excited to get into that with you guys. So let's stand, let's pray. It's good to be with you. Father, we are just so, so honored to be in this place, Lord, to be with one another, but most importantly, to be before you, we realize, like, <laughs> we, don't, we don't deserve what you've given to us. We don't des- even deserve to call upon your name, and yet you've changed our hearts and you've changed the posture of our spirit so that we are now able to respond to you and love you and, and exalt you and praise your name because you have done for us what we can never do for ourselves. So thank you, Lord, for gathering us so that we can leave this place understanding now, once again, the purpose you have for us. And this is not about our kingdom. It's about your kingdom. It's not about our name, but it's about the name of Christ. So empower us and move us in that direction so that, Lord, you will continue to build your church and the promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So thrilled to be loved and known by you. Be glorified in our lives, Lord, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day. We'll see you soon, all right, guys? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Almond School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.